unmute. You're on mute, Doctor. You're muted, Martha. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Moreno Vega. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're continuing today the conversations that we started last month uh, around the issue of equity, justice, uh, racism, and how do we combat in this moment, in this historic moment in time, how do we forge a path going forward for our communities? We're in a historic moment. We're at a crossroads, as Esmeralda uh, said earlier. And this crossroads has roads that we need to look at, we need to investigate, we need to understand before we move forward. And part of that is the narrative, right? How do we understand the moment of now? How do we understand what's going uh, forward? People are talking in double talk. Uh, using terminology that sounds right, but in essence, the actions have been criminal and we know that they've been criminal. And people have even been questioning what criminal is, even though we see it before our eyes. So um, we wanted to continue this conversation uh, because we feel it's important for our own, for you to hear the thoughts that are coming out of our thinkers uh, when we look at media, when we look at TV, we're looking at people who are not necessarily from our communities, are not experiencing what we're experiencing, um, and in essence, uh, not speaking truth, the truth that we're experiencing, the challenges that we are overcoming, the joys that we are having as well. So that we wanted to continue this conversation looking at narrative, looking at truth telling and also understanding how white supremacy is full blown in our eyes happening and how it affects us, has affected us and will continue to affect us if we don't disrupt it. We have a responsibility as people who are part of institutions, people who are family members, people who are protecting our communities to be present and know what's happening and know how to articulate it. So um, a friend of mine has decided that she's going to live in Puerto Rico. And um, I've seen Caridad, like I've seen Lumumba grow up in our institutions. And I asked her to join us as a wordsmith, as a poet and share some of her thoughts in terms of the moment of now, how words, the narrative has to help us, right? Sculpt what we want going forward, uh, define our ideas as we're going forward, look at our historical journey, as well as look at our future and envision a future of creativity and justice and equity. So Caridad de la Luz, also known as La Bruja, from the Bronx <laughs> in Puerto Rico. Will you share some thoughts with us? Oh, the, yes. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is a brand new poem and it is in complete alignment with what we are talking about today. And I would just love to share it with you. It doesn't have a title yet, but here it goes. Our resilience has carried us through racist spews of thick drawled hatred in fruit field plantations and meat packed enslavement. With odds stacked, we learned how to fight back. Our elders did not die without teaching us that. While keeping the spirit of those we've lost in this pandemic intact, we are descendants of both the enslaver and the enslaved. But within our own blood, peace must be made. We have always worked towards unity. After all, united is what these states are called. To awaken in a nation of refuge, instead of discarded as refuse, our dreams refused. American nightmares of continued abuse. When the light at the end of the tunnel is blocked by a wall, united we stand, and if we can't stand, we'll crawl past every hateful pitfall. Our history 
lives in the languages. 250 years before English was ever spoken here, on these lands, ancestral hands worked too hard to point out the irony of what had begun dominating our tongues. Broken lips were split for speaking First Nation dialects, where language was colonized by one and enslaved by the other. Does anyone know the indigenous words for love of another? We try to understand the roots of Latin words used in America like e pluribus unum, meaning out of many, one. But when words don't match actions, the interpretation seems to mean out of many races, one to reign supreme. Misusing words turned to hate, embracing no one with a melanated face. The painful truth has been a disgrace. Still, we find the grace to replace the sadness with a smile each day, using love to drive out hate like we were taught by Dr. MLK. We've been considered a threat to those that live in Dixie La La Land who believe Kentucky is American as apple pie. It's actually the apple of its eye. Kentucky is a word in Iroquois, meaning land of tomorrow, and tomorrow has arrived. All these names, like Tennessee, rooted in Creek and Cherokee, Texas, Kansas, Wyoming, real American history is worth knowing. Colorado means red, and Nevada snowing. They've been spoken so fast, but if we say the names slowly, we will feel the ancestral energy that for centuries they've been disowning. Black is the original color of man. To honor thyself is to honor that. Ask yourself anything and the answer is black. The further you go back, the answer is black. Thank, thank you. you, Carida. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce you to the tech person, but also the co um, the co speaker, right, and moderator in uh, this conversation. And um, I thank Olga for helping in crafting. Uh, the work that we've been doing with creative justice and these conversations, because one of the things that we realized that if we don't take control of the media, if we don't uh, make ourselves present in ways that uh, our communities can connect, can uh, respond, can interact with us, um, we'll be invisible and silent. And we will not be invisible. We will not be silent in these moments. So I would like to introduce you to Olga Rivera Chapman. Hola, hola. hola. Um, I am Olga Chapman Rivera. Olga always, she- I she inverted, I heard it. She goes to the power of the Spanish, which is the power of my mom, always first. Um, for, but you know what? It, it, it's how it should be. But um, I, Olga Chapman Rivera, thank you all for being here. I think uh, La Bruja said something that resonated, which is tomorrow has arrived, right? And um, and that connects us with many of the conversations we've had before um, through the series. Uh, we're talking about what's happening today. We're talking about our history, but we're looking forward towards what's gonna happen. How are we gonna narrate? How are we gonna envision uh, tomorrow and how that tomorrow is gonna look like? So before going into our conversation today, we wanted to show a video that we thought was um, a, book, a good beginning to our conversation. So let's go see it. You saw the rage of white supremacists coming for our democracy. You heard the amplification of lies. The election was rigged. Transform into calls for your execution. Fight like hell. You felt a fraction of what black Americans have felt for more than 400 years. And now you know we must end white supremacy. 
So with that um, a very uh, evocative video, um, we start a conversation on the topic of white supremacy. We wanted um, for our viewers, some of our viewers are our students, some of them are people from our community, from a variety of communities, not only here in Puerto Rico where I'm located at, but from the United States, many cities. One of the things that they asked us before um, starting this conversation was, what is white supremacy? Because there's so much information out there and there's a lot of confusion. So Marta, um, if, you, if you please tell us what is white supremacy so that we can start framing and then having our conversation on it. Well, understanding uh, the experiences I as a person have had and historical experiences. And we have lawyers on the panel that I want uh, to weigh in. When we look at white supremacy, or when I understand white supremacy, it is someone thinking they are better than I and controlling my actions and my ability to reach what I need to reach. It also refers to people thinking that they were born better, that somehow their blood is different than my blood. Their color gives privilege to having control over my body, my actions, my ability to achieve what I need to achieve. So that when we're looking at white supremacy, we're looking at race, yes, but we're also looking at the stopping of the ability of what people who consider themselves white, define themselves as white supremacists, is controlling the other, suppressing the other, and not allowing the other to thrive. Thank you, um, Marta. And um, the lawyers in the room, um, would you comment on white supremacy from a legal standpoint? And what is it? What is it? Is it written in our constitution? Oh, uh, uh, first of all, I am very happy to be here with my sister Isis. Um, uh, and uh, you should never give lawyers the floor, okay? Because we could just take over. Um, we'll we stop you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. First of all, I don't use the term, I use the term white supremacy. I use the term the myth of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. The myth of white supremacy. There is no such thing as white supremacy. But there are, this nation was founded on um, the fact that, that uh, white men with property, and some of the property was us, was, was, was African human beings, uh, including uh, George Washington had 13 enslaved people uh, before when he was uh, when he was 13 years old. Um, I'm sorry to go off like that, but I just want to illustrate it. Um, these people believed that they were entitled to more than the rest of the people, and the rest of the people were the majority of the people. Uh, they were excluding women. They were excluding Native Americans. The people who are here, whose land they stole, they were excluding them. Obviously, they were they were excluding uh, um, Africans, whether they be enslaved or not. Uh, they was they were excluding uh, Asians. They excluded uh, Jewish people, and they excluded anyone that they considered to be mulatto of or, or lat. Uh, or Spanish at that point in time. They were the enemy, as a matter of fact. Uh, the, the Spanish colonizers were the enemy. So this whole idea, they set up a system, a legal system of entitlements for themselves. Uh, they set up a system where they had the nerve to actually say that um, anyone that was not free was considered to be three-fifths of a person. Uh, in other words, you are human. You are only three-fifths human. So I don't know what the other two-fifths were, according to them. But in terms of your rights, you had none. 
but they wanted to count you for their power in the House of Representatives as three fifths of a person, the slaveholders. Uh, the economic system was based on oppression. Uh, the cultural system, uh, they rejected lots of things they didn't like from Europe. They kept the things that made them more wealthy. Uh, so I, I am going to disperse any idea that uh, there was any war ever in this country for freedom. The war was about money. It really was about taxation by, by, by Britain, then England, uh, of the colonies. And they wanted to keep all their money for themselves. Let's be frank about this. Uh, and they didn't want them governing them. They didn't want them telling who they could enslave. They didn't want anybody interfering with their property. So this is a, a heartless uh, mechanism that was uh, bolstered up by pseudoscience, people who actually did, um, I'm sorry, uh, scholars who did experiments, uh, bogus experiments, the, the mm -hmm. size, yeah, yeah, say it, eugenics, eugenics. The, size of the, mm -hmm. the size of the head, the size of the brain, <laughs> how much space is between here and here, as if that makes any difference in a person. But they were saying that those things, and they were uh, uh, definitely apportioning everything negative to Africans and people of color, uh, including Asians. And they were apportioning everything that was good in turn and brilliant to Europeans. So let's be clear here. And uh, this whole term of white is really an American thing that they have exported. There is no such thing as white. It's Europeans. And the whole idea of white supremacy is something that um, that lots of people, lots, look at how many people voted for the former president. Don't be saying it's just some hillbillies. No. Lots of white folks voted for him because he was going to maintain something that they find to be important is necessary for their existence in this country. And that is privilege to them because born uh, uh, European descendant. I'm sorry, I, Isis, I did take up a lot of time. Thank you. Isis, do you have a comment? We lost Isis. Oh, we lost her. <laughs> Hmm. So how does it manifest today? Just so that historically you're making the connect. Let's make the connection between history and now. Right. Why is how it does still it, important? How does it manifest today? It yes, manifests absolutely. today in terms of the wealth gap, the ludicrous wealth gap. <clears throat> All you have to do is take a look at of the people who are on, who are controlling uh, 97, no, I'm wrong now. It's now 99% of the resources of this country are controlled by 33% uh, of the people. And those people are Europeans. Then maybe there's one or two per person of color, but the majority of them are European. And, and it is also manifest by centuries and centuries of discriminatory practices by the government so that people of color could not get ahead economically, could not get ahead education. I'm talking legal discrimination. Uh, I'm talking about uh, fair housing. So I'm talking about housing uh, discrimination that was backed up by the government. I'm talking about uh, 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 an inability of people to get into professions. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the fact that our children had inferior everything that was supposed to be government issued. And how is it affecting us right now? Well, all we have to do is see that there are some people, all those people who voted for the former president, there are some people who think it is so important that they are willing to support someone who is a liar, an obviously mentally ill, 
and who was willing to risk the entire nation for himself because he believes in what Hitler believed in, the superiority of, of the, the quote, white race. Uh, Hitler didn't use those terms. And they want to make sure that that is continued. So what do they do now? They do things like separate children at the border. They slander every single non-white race in this country was slandered by this president. They, they ab abuse um, the idea of women being equal and the idea of women being anything but sex objects. They, they continue. Oh, they declare anyone who wants to assert that they love their heritage, particularly their African heritage, that they are um, terrorists. And they call, they call us uh, black identity extremists. I have to say half the people on this phone call are, would fall into that category because we believe in our heritage. So this is a culture war, but it's much more than that. Because if we get swept up in paying attention to what they tell us we should be paying attention to, instead of organizing our communities for what we determine we need, we'll spend another 50 years wandering in this, in this arid desert that's called America. I think it's also important to point out, right, that um, statistics are showing that even COVID vaccines, if we want to look at how it works every day, right, for the average person, because sometimes people hear uh, speaking and say, well, these are people who are not within our community or scholars or lawyers and so on and so forth. No, our families are being impacted. Our elders are being impacted because they don't have access to the vaccine. Right, we yeah, know that, that it's being that's prime, it's being that's distributed. Right now, example, the disparities continue. Not only did we are the ones that got the most sick, now we're not getting the vaccine. They're not even making it available to us. And if you don't have the internet, you are doubly taxed in terms of being able to make an appointment. It's absolutely ludicrous the way they have set this up, and. All they have to look at are what are the barriers that would stop poor people of color and, and actually and elders, poor or not, mm -hmm. from being able to live. And and there it is. Poor health care, poor, no hospitals, low health services, and now they, we can't even get the vaccine. Sandra, how does it work here in Puerto Rico? Because I should say, we should say to the audience, there are some of us in Puerto Rico, there are some of us in the snow in New York, and there's some of us in Jamaica. So that, how does it work? You're muted, Sandra. I'm sorry. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with such a distinguished panel of people that I really do admire, particularly Rosa, which I still need to talk to you, but, but I do admire you and all of you. Um, I'd like to say um, regarding the uh, white supremacy before I talk about what's going on in Puerto Rico, how I see white supremacy and from my experience and as a reporter, as a journalist, I, I also like to talk a little bit about history and um, even though we might not talk about the past, we have to acknowledge that white supremacy uses history and um, to fuel its fictions, um, its promulgators, anchor their vision on a racist future of mythical depictions of their past. Their history is invented. What they say is invented and they glorify um, characters and, 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 uh, and people that did not take uh, the, the full responsibility for their acts. In today's media narratives and sources, we often seem shocked when we see the news and uh, when we see contemporary expressions of racism, particularly after what happened at, at, um, at the con with the Congress insurrectionist, um, that surprised, as, it, as in the video stated, m most of the uh, public that is not used to being harassed uh, for their color of their skin or for their religion or for their gender 
or for their identity or their nationality. So the, the rest of the population got surprised and got, as the video mentioned, it was a little bit of hint of what they experienced. So um, I, I would like to say that uh, the contemporary expressions of white supremacies are also expressions of racism, xenophobia, hatred, sexism, and all what is um, a prejudice against somebody else. Um, and the violent present that American public is experience is not exclusive to the United States of America. We have seen a, tendence, a trend in the entire world with some populations being feel threatened in Europe. And, um, and also it, it tends to deal with the ideas on, and the uh, uh, feelings and, and the history and the ideas that the ideals that people cherish tend to be rooted in words and, and, and traditions that sometimes tend to be confused and used uh, negatively by the racist and the people that are implemented their supremacy. So as people of color, I do think we have to fight back with knowledge. We have to fight back also with history and also with words be, and, and be careful in, in reflecting our issues, acknowledging what we are experiencing, and also re-examining the way we as communities are helping other communities working together and seeing our common expressions and our co common experiences of, of what's going on. We have to understand um, and, uh, and also we have to not only acknowledge but understand our history and our racial past and begin to heal and, and learn what, uh, and unlearn what we have been taught historically. We have to go back and understand other aspects of history. History is not monolithic. It, ha it has many aspects. Well, and history is the telling of the conqueror, right? So that it's important what you do. But because I Because we need to write, and we need our people to write. Right. Well, I do think that us as storytellers, we have to acknowledge that in order to, to move forward. But also we have to do it thinking about that we're not the only ones in the world that are experiencing the, some sort of discrimination. If you look around in, in the rest of the world, in Puerto Rico, in Latin America, in Europe, you will see certain patterns that are the same. Some groups tend to be, they want to be the to reclaim the supremacy of the over the rest of the population. And when you think about why nationalists and why supremacists in the States, I do stress that um, the American uh, and, and the um, uh, communities, the people of course must understand and study the tactics and what is going on in places in Europe. Because th these are, hate is fueled by misconceptions and by mis quoting the truth. So I think that's a very important aspect that we all need to take into consideration moving forward. If I can, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Olga. Yes, no, no, no. go ahead. Yeah, I, I think, I think um, what's, what's important, and I appreciate what everyone has shared, you know, Nellie Fuller, I believe it was Nellie Fuller who said that, um, you know, if you don't understand white supremacy, everything else will, everything else will only confuse you. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that we have to understand that our existence in what in, in the so-called new world is rooted in this fallacy. But I think what's more important for me at least is not necessarily this idea of what other people believe they are in terms of supremacy or not, but it's how we believe that as well. So the flip of white superiority is indigenous inferiority, exactly. black inferiority, mm -hmm. Asian inferiority. The idea that we will open up space and allow other people to come into that space, right? The idea that we will acquiesce to those folks. That for me is the most dangerous part of it, but understanding that one can't exist without the other. You can't have someone who says that they are superior to another people and not have those people believe it, right? Because if they didn't believe it, it would not be what it is today. So I think for me, that is one of the most fundamental dangers of it. Um, and to understand that even though it exists, that our people have been fighting it since they came to get us off the shores of, 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 of the continent. And then we have a legacy of resistance, a legacy of struggle, a legacy of, of, of liberation that counters that narrative. And that legacy exists today. 
And so when we talk about how it manifests, how it exists, it exists and it manifests in the schools that we go that, that we go to. It, it manifests itself in the prices that we're facing when we go to our supermarkets. It exists whether or not we have heat or hot water. It exists in the, the limited amount of, of, of choices we have in this so-called democracy. Uh, it exists in, in pay, pay wages and salaries. It defines the actual essence of this country. There is no way the United States of America would exist without this false concept of white supremacy. Yeah, can I can I jump in? Because it's funny. This is what I just wrote as I was listening, Nilly Fuller. So, I mean, this only confirms that uh, Lumumba is my comrade, but that we're also Maita's babies and she taught as well. Uh, so for me, uh, systemic white supremacy does exist. And Amos Wilson and Bobby Wright talked about this within the context of also sexuality, entertainment, housing, culture, politics, economics, media, institutions, immigration, and migration. You know, and I think it is instructive for particularly younger folks to understand that although we are individual, when we wake up in the morning, we live our lives within a community and in the collective that I often tell younger people that I mentor or teach that, you know, it's not your individual fault that your parents cannot afford a 25% increase in their rent. That is not your fault, but it would be a disservice if we didn't teach younger people that not only do we have to read more, and look at so many people that have laid down the history for us. But as Sandra talked about, what does this look like internationally at this moment? So Esmeralda spoke to the fact that more white people voted for Trump in this election than last one. I focus on the 53% of also white women. So if I'm in a room with four white women, two of you voted for Trump. And you're not from, like as Manala said, you're not from West Virginia, you're not from Kentucky, or all these stereotypes that particularly the media and American has about what it is to be a white person that is poor and also neglected in the political and, and system in the United States of America. So it's real easy to be like, oh yeah, that's somebody in Kentucky. No, that could be the chancellor of a university, a white woman, who purports diversity, recruitment, retention, but has voted for Trump. And for me, that has been instructive in this way. I watched the beginning of the impeach impeachment trial today as a news junkie. And when they showed the video, the montage at the beginning, where now you see it all put together second by second, what was happening when they're doing their job and these white supremacists are coming, I thought to myself, oh, this was a warm up practice. Because in part of the video montage, you will hear one white man say, if we have 30,000 guns, we're good. Well, in the United States of America, 85% of the guns are owned by white people and 30% by former military. And I also think we need to talk about the fact that one out of the four that have been charged are military people because that was a military assault. And I think it is right to call it not only an insurrection and attempted coup and that we That's need to the international community mm -hmm. to see how they have dealt with attempted coups and the way they have dealt with it is by revolutionary struggle rooted in cooperative economics, rooted in this is our culture, this is our practices. And lastly, Maita, you mentioned COVID. Native American communities are not only being decimated, when yeah. elders are gone, they cannot pass down the language that La Bruja spoke about. Mm -hmm. The same with Latinos in East LA. It's a thousand percent increase of death in the Latino community just in the state of California. So we have to talk about the systemic part and then we have to talk about how we resist it, not only through our narratives, but our actions. Exactly. Absolutely. Thesis, you're with us. Can, I, can you connect? Are you connected? 
Yes. Yes, I'm connected. Yay. <laughs> Sorry about bouncing off earlier and thank you for having me. It's a um, beautiful discussion so far with people I really respect and, um, and love. So yeah, um, one of the things that Rosa just talked about was, and everybody so far is the, the systemic nature of it. And I think Esmeralda did a really beautiful job laying down the foundation for that. This idea of white supremacist culture, right? This white supremacist culture permeates all, like Lumumba said, all of our culture. And so I think that, uh, un, I mean, this lie has been the lie since the invention and the weaponization of race. It precedes America, but it, but it has such a fertile, has such a fertile and important part in the formation of America that it has permeated all of the culture, basically, of what we call American culture. And I think that the way to address it is to is to hit it square on and to call it what it is, white supremacist culture. You gotta name it in order to know what you're combating. I think you have to um, identify it, unpack it in your schools, in your communities, in your workplaces, in every single aspect, in civic organizations, in spiritual houses, in every single aspect of our community. And to Lumumba's point, within ourselves, because this indoctrination into white supremacist culture is the, is the public school system and it is everything in, in higher education system and everything in between. So I think, you know, naming it, identifying it, unpacking, and then committing to dismantling it head on, right? I think that one of the shifts that I have seen is um, a shift away from this idea of diversity, inclusion, equity, and really to anti-racism, right? If, you, if you're going to get to the heart of the problem, you got to name it and you got to say, I'm dismantling racism. And every business, every corporation, every institution, all of the things that I in every school, pre-K and up has to, has to, in my opinion, take that stance, take that intentional stance that what they are doing is an anti-racist stance and figure out what are the things in their institution that promotes and perpetuates white supremacy and figure out how to dismantle that in terms of the policies, in terms of the hiring, in terms of every single aspect of what's going on in those institutions. And so I think that telling the truth is important because we've all said white supremacy is a lie but it is the lie, you know, it is the American lie. It is, it is beyond just a lie. And so I think that these um, insurrectionists, terrorists, whatever you want to call them, they're part of what uh, Marta was talking about earlier, this flipping of uh, constructs and ideas. They call themselves patriots, yet they're about insurrection against the government, right? So there you go. Um, they say that they're for law and order, yet these are the people who um, allegedly beat to death a, a, a cop inside the Capitol. Um, and other ones of them who during the Black Lives Matter um, summer or the uprising um, intentionally, allegedly, intentionally crossed state lines in order to, mur to, with the intent and with the effect of murdering law enforcement. So they hide behind these words and these ideas, we're for freedom, we're for this, we're for that, and they co-opt these concepts and bastardize them, and we have to just continuously un uncork that screw, you know, that they continuously hide behind. Because I think that the propaganda of all of this, I mean, this is really, it's more, it's an intentional attack. What happened, um, you know, there's these these perpetual boogeymen, right? The new boogeyman out there is critical race theory, right? Um, and and to the extent that it even got up all the way to Donald Trump and he created some policies against it and also created a 1776 commission um, to then tell the patriotic American lie. It was a big piece of white propaganda, white supremacist propaganda. And apparently uh, Biden has dismantled the commission already, but make no mistake, these ideas are being 
battled, right? There is a battle of ideas and there is an intentional, intentional perversion of words, of language, of ideas in order to win the hearts and minds of 75 million Americans to vote for the former president. Well, then what do we construct or how do we construct it, right? Because most of us have built institutions because once we understood it, at whatever age we understood it, we understood not to be in those institutions and create institutions so that we could teach our next generation, right? Uh, to think differently, to act differently. So how do we structure that? Because the school systems are complicit, right? All of the institutions that are built have been built to pass on that myth, that idea of white supremacy, right? That's, that's their purpose. And every time that we have gone to these institutions as the people that we are, we have had to leave those institutions and build our own. Right. So how do we do this? Mm -hmm. That's the key. Right. Because I think that now, you know, if whoever doesn't understand it after January 6th, right, has is blind and not hearing, not seeing, not talking. Right. We have built institutions purposefully to make sure that our children and the next generation thinks better and acts better. How do we do that in mass? How do we mm -hmm. do that bigger? In mass. In mass. Think, in mass. Right? Well, I think you I think you've answered part of the question in that we absolutely have to prioritize our own educational institutions. No question about it. There's no getting around it like we have to. But it also has to be do what do what you can where you are. So if we're running banks, if we're running other institutions, we have to make sure that we are working from a different framework that really flips on its head, this whole idea of what our positioning is in a global context. That is what we have to do. We have to demystify that it's something that happens in the next generation. Like we have the immediate urgent task to do right now all that we can to flip this dynamic. And so wherever you are, and again, if you're an instructor, you're in an absolutely key role. If you are in cultural arts, if you are storytellers, those are the people that help to really reframe what our understanding of ourselves are and how we see ourselves in the world. Those people are extremely important. The work that we do with, with uh, rap artists, the work that Rosa has been doing with rap artists, we're trying to get them to uh, uh, use their platform for something else. All of that is absolutely necessary. And we have some amazing models that we know have worked already. We know that there is a necessity of building independent black educational institutions. When we talk about in mass, that's not gonna be the answer for in mass because we know not everybody's gonna be able to afford black independent schools, right? But we do know that where we can do that, we have to do that. We absolutely 100% have to do that. I think the flip side of all of this though right now is that white supremacy and patriarchy are so insidious that we're in a moment where it is our own people that are pushing white supremacy and patriarchy, right? Um, black Agenda Re Report talks really brilliantly about the black misleadership class. Young people are very confused right now. They're very confused when they see boycott Amazon and then 10 days later see Amazon saying Black Lives Matter. Not because Black Lives Matter said use this slogan or they're, they're, they're trying to support Colin Kaepernick and he just made a deal with Ben and Jerry's for ice cream for the liberation. Now that's, I'm not trying to individually critique what Colin Kaepernick has done, but what the NFL has done is completely erase him from now the work that they're saying they're putting towards and the money towards racial justice. And concretely, how I want people to understand this is if we look at the last two years of the, the, the cases around police violence, more than half of those cities were run by Democrats and very specifically Rochester, New York. For those that don't know, I'm in Albany, New York. Rochester is three hours away. So in late 2020, we saw the, the video of Daniel Pertu being choked in the middle of the street naked in a Rochester winter. 
Well, last week we saw Rochester police pepper spray a nine-year-old girl because her mother called for mental health services. Rochester has a black democratic mayor who's a woman, a black police chief, a black district attorney. Albany, New York has a black DA that 90% of his prosecutions have been against young African-American men, a woman mayor, a black human rights commissioner, and a black police chief. So for me, that means where are we now able to critique in the most loving way, but the most real way, as opposed to now when you put forward a critique of certain people that are actually making money and have monetized black death that look like us, that's not a trigger issue. That shouldn't trigger you. That should be us being able to go, what's the point of all these nonprofits if they're funding the same thing we're trying to fight in a way? And it's something that I'm struggling with. I'm not going to lie. I'm like, I'm struggling with it because I want to support everything that is black and brown. But if the Obama administration has taught me anything and currently the fact that Biden and Harris are refusing in a way to just stop deportations in general until they figure out this, what's, what does that mean? What does it mean to be visible and have all this around you if we're the ones that are now the ones that look like we're repressing or oppressing what can be resistance? May I, may I add something here in what you're saying, um, Rosa, I agree. It doesn't matter if you're black or you're Latino uh, or you're a woman, if you're not aware of where you have to stand for. I just, when you, I was listening to you, my, the uh, former governor of Puerto Rico came into my mind. She used to be the, the head of the, of the women, women's department, um, women's um, agency, women's rights agency. And all her policies were against women. She was she was not she she refused to sign in a bill to create a state of emergency dealing with domestic violence, which is a huge situation in Puerto Rico, particularly with with within the pandemic. So it doesn't matter if you're a woman or you're or, or you're a black person or you're a Latino if you're not aware of your history and you're not also aware of the differences and 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 that side of the of the equation. So I think education, as Lumumba said, has to be key. But there's another side that I like to add, and I was writing what, when you were talking, and I do think there are four steps that we have to take into consideration. The first one would be to increase criminal um, penalties for crimes against people of color, lynchings, or we have to, Congress should, do, should go that way. Um, the other one would be to strengthen mechanism to counter violence, a counter violent white supremacy abroad. Why? Because as, as I mentioned before, United States, it's inheriting those traits. I just um, I just remember what happened in, in um, New Zealand and in places like in France and, and Russia where white supremacists are claiming and, and attacking a people of different races and, and, and uh, religions, and you see the same tactics that are being used in, in America. The third uh, idea that I have is to root out violence, a violent white supremacy in the military and in law enforcement uh, institutions. And the fourth one would be to improve data collection, um, particularly on domestic terror threats. And I, do, I, I think there's a big uh, misconception there, particularly during uh, Donald Trump's presidency, where the statistics were not being paid attention for. And, and I do think that that's one area that, that can help move forward. Mm -hmm. if, if, if I can, I just wanted to respond to that. I think we have to be real careful with what we are proposing mm -hmm. as uh, solutions to uh, root out white supremacy. So mm -hmm. first of all, personally, I don't believe that we're actually um, positioned uh, in this country to root out white supremacy without totally rebuilding this this this, this structure as we know it. Mm -hmm. um, the military, law enforcement, especially those two, 
are firmly rooted <laughs> in, in white supremacy. Really? And it so when we talk about and, right, and so when we talk about trying but to make sure patrols. it comes totally out of it. So when we talk about really trying to implement laws that would be designed to do that, understand that our people have always been hit with the negative effect of those unintentionally, maybe. But we can talk okay. about creating laws that will deal with issues around uh, discrimination of, you know, right? we're the ones that end up getting hit with that, even if it was initially designed to mm -hmm. protect us. Right. The military also. So we have to be really careful without, but when we talk about that, as we know it now, the law enforcement, the criminal injustice complex has to be totally dismantled. It is incapable of in any way, shape or form uh, 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 trying to assert and protect or defend the rights of African people, of people of color. It's incapable. It was never designed to do so and it won't do so. The military complex as well, which is why we have the foreign policies that we see happening all over the country. So when we talk about dismantling it, I mean, we really are talking about creating a totally new structure the United States government cannot exist, cannot exist without white supremacy. So what you're, uh, what you're thinking about is, that, and you're mentioning is that you have to completely dismantle the police, dismantle the, the military, create something new. We but absolutely have to. There's no, there's no getting around it. <laughs> my question and my point, when I mentioned th those um, ideas, it's just, and I, I am aware of, of the history of laws turning against Latinos and also African Americans, but the truth is that how are we going to fight against what is going on? Look at what is going on at the uh, at Congress. Um, half of the Republicans were saying that that uh, they you know they were neglecting and 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 refusing to admit what happened on January the sixth. So I do think um, either we're lacking uh, cohesiveness in education as a whole. Or are we acting in strategy development? I don't know where, but, but but I do think people, the communities of color, have to get together and try to develop a, a at least a strategy to move forward. Right. And there are some. I, I think I think, goes, I think it goes. I think it goes deeper than that. I think it goes deeper than that. I, I agree, uh, and, and I wanted to comment on, on and every. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to comment on, on what Sandra was saying and, and Lumumba, okay. because again- Somebody's what, typing, is somebody typing? I, 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 I hear I'm typing too. Um, oh, okay. um, going back to Puerto Rico and, and two points that were very important uh, that were mentioned is that one is the access to media uh, that, that, that regular people have Right, not not people in the media, but everybody else and education. I think that in Puerto Rico, one one thing that is important to note is that when schools were closed, those closings of school impacted directly black communities, Africa Af Af African descent communities, and poor communities of all races in Puerto Rico. So the impact of, of that lack of education was huge, but not only that. If you see that every every school district that is predominantly black, every school district that is poor, as it happens in many in many cities, inner cities and out of the city in the United States, was impacted. They received the lowest scores and the worst education. So when you at least are receiving a little bit of history of Puerto Rico and the world, our communities are not receiving anything. Um, and I was I was also reading um, a comment that John Powell from from Berkeley made that he was he was actually in um, in Alabama and he was talking to people about Affordable Care Act and everybody was white on the audience and everybody says they said they were against it but then when he was asking questions to go deep into why are you against it um, have you ever had anything denied for care have you ever and they were everybody was standing up and in the end of the conversation they realized that they actually were for it in many ways but they didn't even know that they were for it because they didn't have the information and not only because they didn't have the information but because there was so much falsehood so many lies 
that they were listening to uh, by their government officials, by institutions, by the media. So it's uh, to Lumumba's point and, and how I see it in terms of, 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 of digital and tech is if we had a problem of software, we said we change the software. If we have a problem of hardware, we change the hardware. But being this that is systemic, we have a problem of hardware and software. So how do we go about that without changing it systemically, right? Um, so, so then my question is, how do we create a strategy that the institutions that are right now fighting, some of the institutions that you have founded and other institutions can, can then actually get that and put it into a, a framework or a network? How do we get power within the groups of institutions from different backgrounds, from the Latinos and Asians and LGBT community and Black and African American communities and Native communities to have actionables towards what's happening today um, that goes to the hardware and the software problem that we're having? Well, I, I, I believe that uh, this is a very basic question about power. Um, and right. the only reason there is a, a myth of white supremacy and the only reason why they insist on white supremacy is because they want to maintain power over everyone and they want to maintain power over all the resources. So it's not, they're not in it uh, really. Well, some of them are, I guess, but they're not, most of them are not in it for the real mythology. They're in it because they want resources and they want power. Uh, and I believe something that has been said here today is really, really crucial. That most of our people are just as brainwashed as everyone else in this country, as the majority of people in this country. So the, you could have a police chief, you could have a mayor, you could have whatever. They mm -hmm. don't even know what the best tactics are to empower their own community. Uh, so I, I have been pushing for folks to get on, to start on the ground, to start working with reputable organizations that are doing basic organizing in our communities. I don't care which, what island you're on. I don't care uh, what community, what level you're, where you are. I don't care which, which, which part of our communities you want to work with, indigenous or, or, um, or, or Latino or, or colonized or, or in the Bronx or in Brooklyn, um, African descended, you know, Asian, uh, LGBTQ. I, I, to me, what really matters is that we need to start some very basic working on the ground toward things that are going to empower our community uh, bit by bit and doing basic political education. I've been working with a group of, of a millennium, I can't even say the word, um, uh, uh, for the last nine months, we have been going through Amos Wilson's uh, Blueprint, Blueprint for Black Power and, and his lectures because we, we, need to, we needed to get at the level of brainwashing that we all have in us getting to our consciousness and in you know way back in the 60s and 70s some of us went through things which we call conscious raising and you know and we did a lot of political education well that hasn't been repeated we need to start that again well, that's where no the artist to... movements were uh, were very important in the exactly. 70s and, and, and i mean popular music dealt with it um, artists dealt with it, visual artists dealt with it. I mean, it was like a whole tone in the country, right? A whole message in the country. You know, you had artists like Nina Simone, you have, you know, still Ruben Blades, you know, there are artists that are focused on that. And it goes back to a point that you told me, uh, Lubumba, and it ties in Olga, because you said like people were reacting to how beautiful the imagery of the series that we have done is, right? That people were responding to you and saying, how beautiful the imagery, right? And I think that that's critical in terms of how the message goes out and how is it framed and how is the language framed? 
right? Going to what uh, Esmeralda and uh, Sandra are saying, how do we frame it? And when I said mass, I mean like there are billboards, right? What What is the internet if it's not mass, right? What is the content of that, right? Because I was a public school teacher. I stopped public school teaching when I realized that I was complicit because if I followed a curriculum, my kids would be as dumb as I was growing up, right? So the question was, what did I have to do in order to be different, right? But where does where do you learn that? Right? Where do you learn that? Where is the structure that you learn that? You had the East, Lubumba. You had the East. Your parents created a school. Right? Um, how do we do that? Because we were doing it and it was smashed. We know it was smashed intentionally, but we we're at a different space at a different time and in different places. So, what does that look like going forward? Well, I mean, I, I, I would say that we need to now more than ever get back to the root of institutional building, you know, and obviously, Mike, as, uh, as you mentored us, so many of us, I think part of your story is actually not told enough. Right now, if we were to look at the United States and cultural um, institutions that are inherently political because of the culture and politics are not separated. Mm -hmm. You and, and Melody and Lauda and, and you know, cup maybe five, maybe 10, we could say right now, institutions in this country not only not have a legacy that are still intact and moving forward, you know, and, and I do believe that the generation I'm in, the hip hop generation, we made a crucial mistake in thinking that nonprofits were gonna be a way that we would get in and solve these problems. And and the reality is with, with me, Lamumba, so many of us, especially on the Richie, Richie made it clear, like when you get up in these institutions, get the resources for the people. But I think a younger generation is now still in this weird way wanting whiteness to accept them. They want whiteness at the end mm. to say, good job. I see you. Of course I have white privilege. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna put you on the cover of Vogue magazine and you know, your people's problems are solved. I'm really, and, and I'm not saying this, I'm saying this because I am really processing in this time, understanding why also, intellectual endeavors and political consciousness raising endeavors are exactly what we need at this moment to bring all the intellectualism that we already have you know and so when again when i was looking at the video today the most thing that struck me was not one officer pulled out their gun mm -hmm. not one officer except the one Capitol Police parliament that don't really use a gun, shot the woman because he believed, I'm sure, that if she got in there, it was gonna be a bloodbath. But in that, when I think of everything we've been through and our young people did this summer and everything they face in Puerto Rico, you're gonna tell me that all of this just happened and not but one officer ever pulled out their weapon. That's what we need to be telling younger people. That unfortunately is power in the United States is actual military and imperialist power. The only way we fight that back is through institutional building and raising political consciousness. So Lubumba, you grew up in this institution. What did it do for you? And then, you know, it's not, not just what it did for me, but what it did for our community. I mean, okay. we were able to create um, institutions that reflected the best of who we are, um, what we uh, uh, come from, and what our vision was. And I think for the immediate Bed-Stuy, Central Brooklyn, even broader New York, and internationally for that matter, people benefited from the establishment of the East. 
There's no question about it. So it was really an, an opportunity for us to do for us all of the things that we know that ne needed to happen. So we needed to have fresh fruits and vegetables for us to eat. We created a co-op and that's what we did. And people were able to access it there. We needed to educate our children. We created Uhuru Sasa Shule and that's what we did. We needed uh, new, We needed news that was reflective. We created black news. So, the, the, But the principle that guided all of this was self-determination. That there's no one else that's gonna do it for us. There's absolutely no one else that's going to do it for us. If we want to see it happen, we have to do it ourselves. If we want to be able to create safety in our communities, we have to know what it means to create safety in our communities. We know that we have to deal with issues around poverty, issues around health, mental health, issues around education, housing. We know that all of those things are real non-punitive ideas of what safety looks like. And we know that we have not only the ability, but we have the responsibility to make those things happen. And so that, that's one of the major lessons of the East. And it wasn't just the East. It was institutions that were created in, in Philadelphia, in Chicago, in Atlanta, of Black-centered uh, uh, focus that wanted to make sure that we created programming, uh, a vision, and activities that was a, an incubator for our communities to do all that we needed to do. And where are those institutions now? And what happened to those institutions? Well, we know the state attacked us hard. And we know that is definitely a, a part of, of that story. And there are lessons to be learned from that, right? That, that, that the, some of the lessons are, we know that's going to happen, how do we prepare for it? We know that's gonna happen, how do we create independent sources of income to make sure that we are not depending on grants to keep us alive? You know, we know that's gonna happen, how do we create a kind of buffer of, 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 of protection from our neighbors, our security, um, a, a broader security mechanism from our community so they know what they're, how they need to be able to protect and defend our institutions. Um, we learned some valuable lessons. We learned some very valuable lessons. And, and when I look at some of these institutions that are coming up now, they don't look aesthetically like the ones that we we, we um, created, but that's good. It doesn't need to look like that. It's it's, mm -hmm. it's it's changed for this time. Mata, you talked about the young people that are taking over land in Puerto Rico to to plant. Well, that's it. That's what we're doing. That, that's 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 what it is. Like, do what you can where you can. We know that. We know that in New York City there are more vacant properties than they are homeless people. That that study was done by an independent housing organization. We know that you can easily solve the housing crisis in New York City if you do that. So people are doing things like homesteading. People are doing things like squatting because they're taking this whole framework and flipping it on its head. No, I'm not going to sit there and file an application and wait for four years and hope that you pick me. No, it is an empty place over there. I'm going to sit myself down in there with my family and we're going to be housed. Well, that was an important movement in terms of taking over property and taking yes. over houses and squatters, especially in the Lower East Side, exactly. in Brooklyn. People just exactly. took over houses. Exactly. And claimed exactly. them and, and made them theirs. And understanding that it's it's far more necessary now. We know that in 2020, the poverty rate has increased dramatically, but it also, we saw an increase of, what do they call it now? There's a new term for these extra billionaires, central billionaires, I think was the name that they were created. There were three people whose, whose wealth level put them into the next gap of beyond billionaires. In the year that people are dying, I think for us to really just get it, I mean, we, it can't be much clearer, quite honestly, of what's valued, who's going to be left out if we don't do things ourselves. And I have a question, Lumumba. What kind of resources um, were there when you were growing up on those um, on, on the institution for the creation of those institutions? And, and my question comes because we were today Marta and I were, were in Puerto Rico and we were at Corredor Afro. We're talking about uh, the community and about specifically young kids that feel, um, that are feeling excluded, right? Um, and are feeling that the allocation of resources, there's resources, but the allocation of those resources never get to them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so within our communities, um, in the ground, what level of education, what level of awareness, what level of knowledge we need to be able to build that from the ground up? 
Right. I'll say this. We can't let the uh, aspiration of the perfect be the enemy of, of the good. So we actually can do things what we have now. We will build it. As I like we that can. one. <laughs> we, it's not going to be perfect. We have to do all that we can with what we have. The, the East wasn't perfect. It was far from it. And we know that. Um, but we know that as we begin to build, it's almost like a snowball effect. The, the magic that happens when people see us being able to create institutions that are going to provide the, the, the love, the nurturing support, the resources for ourselves, when you see what that does to a community, it's infectious. It absolutely is infectious. And then you begin to see what the possibilities of people power actually are. So I would say, let's do what we, what we can. I mean, there's so much uh, different sources of creativity, uh, imagination and skills that we have. Let's put it to work. Let's put it to work. I saw you, Sandra, saying yes. And I saw you, EC, saying yes. I was <laughs> you saying yes, too. <laughs> I was going to say, I agree with him. And um, But also, um, I do think that it's important to, to um, fight the narrative. And I, I do think that media literacy, it's, it's a must at this moment, particularly with everything that is going on on social media. Um, it, and, and we have to reclaim, create our, our own spaces to, count, to, to tell us our stories, to, to heighten the, the, the issues that are dear to us in our own particular media. But also, I do think there has to be a concerted effort among the communities to reclaim spaces on traditional media, to combat the uh, pundits that are, you know, um, repeating the same and, and, and keeping the same narratives that are basically distorting sometimes the, the, uh, the truth. So I do think that's part of, of, the, uh, of an education that has to be a, acknowledged. Of course, it has to begin at the uh, local Smaller level within the communities, uh, but also, uh, you know, move well, forward. That's why we decided to have these conversations because we don't see enough of us, mm -hmm. right? And when we see uh, ourselves, it's generally one person coming on for a minute and then being taken off, right? And it's making a statement and being taken off. And it's important mm -hmm. for our communities to see thinkers and people who are thinking about what is happening to us, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that we have now what we didn't have, at least when I was growing up, um, the internet, right? You have technology. There are resources that, you know, we were like printing printers with, uh, what was it? Th those machines that you had to turn, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so now there's a technology that you can print something like a hundred sheets or 200 sheets at almost no money. You know, we were sitting there with little machines turning out flyers and posters and so on and so forth. So some something in me tells me, right, uh, that the capacity we have, we're not using to the max. Mm -hmm. And part of the situation has to be how do we uh, maximize those skills and, those, and that exposure and those resources that are there that some are free and some are not, right? So that we can begin to frame a narrative and, and, and rekindle ethics and narratives that are fused with creativity and a traditional knowledge, right? To pass mm -hmm. on to a young, right? I was talking to all that because a lot of young people say, oh, I, I want you to mentor me. And then when I hear their narrative, right, it kind of like, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, and because it's what Rosa said. They really want to get to what, <laughs> I don't want to say get to white, but I have to say get to white, right? They want those positions that are going to sort of pat them on the head. I'm not interested in mentoring anybody to that, right? So how do we begin to, and then I'll be complicit too, because if I don't mentor, then I'm guilty too, right? Because then I'm saying, you know, what the heck? 
So I shouldn't say what the heck, right? So I'm trying to grapple with how does one do that consciously, right? How does one do that and create change in a mind that before it goes somewhere that is going to be complicit in hurting us, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and let me just say, the why needs to be the center of what we do. Because I think it's easy to mentor in terms of skills to say, this is how you do this. This is how you raise funds. This is how you write press releases. This is how you do that. I think those skills are transferable and people can learn that. But in service of what? To what end? Like, why are we doing this? I think that is where your value comes in. That is where that, you know, th those kinds of narratives can't be really replicated. So if we are able to do that, I, I got into a whole lot of trouble when I wrote this piece about black mentors, black men mentors, and they ended up having this one guy who's I think too short, who's like you know just horrible around his gender stuff. But it got to the question of like who's qualified to be a mentor exactly? Hmm. Like, and what are we mentoring for? Are we just trying to get young people like under the leadership of somebody? If that's the case, well they're doing that now anyway. They under people. Right, but to what end? In service of what? And if we aren't really explicit about what it is we want to see happen, then yes, we're going to be creating. And this is this is my my real critique of a lot of these black male mentorship programs because we're creating the next level of bourgeois people that we're going to be fighting. Exactly, that's my point. You know, I'm, I'm hearing this narrative, and I'm going like, what? <laughs> I think the point was to be to be really clear and intentful. You know, what Rosa was talking about the the dubiousness of black faces in high places. That is that is the end result of a policy of diversity versus a policy of anti racism, right? So we have to talk about what be really clear about what the objectives are because you get a different result in reformation than you get in abolition. You get different results because you started with a different So we have to be clear about that. And I think these conversations are critically important because, um, you know, we don't all agree on everything, you know, and it's really, really important to have these conversations. And there was a, a point that was made earlier, I think it was raised by Sandra about this idea about what to do about the violent, armed, white, paramilitarized militia in this country. And I don't, and then there's a, there is, there is, and there has been a, an impulse, and I hear it all the time um, for the people, from the people in power, just move on. We're just going to move on. This is what the Republicans are saying. And I think that there has to be a discussion about, and to Lumumba's point, I really do understand that it's that it is it, it's a balancing act because we saw the crime bill of the '90s become the mass incarceration bill. We saw the the after effects of 9/11 being the surveillance state against our Muslim brothers and sisters. You know what I mean? So there's we see that dynamic, but I think we have to have a debate about what it is that needs to be done about these particular dangerous people that the government has said are dangerous. They're armed to the hilt. They are infiltrated in military, police, prisons, Congress, um, and all these other places. And I think that there is a debate to be had within what we were talking about, about how it is that we root this out of this society that we, and I'm not, I'm not talking about the idea because that's a difficult thing. And we're talking about ways in which we tell the truth and we win minds and hearts and we, our own minds and hearts primarily. Um, but there has to be an expectation that there, Rosa said these people did a, a uh, test run. They've been doing test runs. They've been doing test runs in Oklahoma, Ruby Ridge. They took over a capital of Michigan this summer, armed to the teeth. They've been doing these runs and they've been dangerous and called the most dangerous uh, element to the homeland. And I think that, you know, we, we need to have a conversation about understanding the tricky minefield of political prisoners, what, you know, what happened in Philadelphia with the move. We understand that all these things can backfire dangerously and violently against us, and they have. 
But this idea that you just that that we move on, I think, is dangerous in and of itself. After the Civil War, those Civil War those Civil War soldiers, those enemies of the state, were allowed to stay in Congress. They were allowed to stay in their positions. They became lionized and glorified, and you know, part of the white supremacist mythology that persists today. And I think that something, there has to be a response um, to what has happened and what it means for us as, an, as a society to say that this, we have to respond to this. We're not, that we can't just say, uh, we'll move on to the next thing and we'll build our this without addressing that. I mean, I think part of it, though, is what we have to now begin to do is counter programming because, look, they're going to get away with it. I know some people might not want to hear that. They're embedded in the U.S. Congress, the executive, the legislator and judicial. And I'm not saying we don't resist that. I'm saying that we now have to counter program against that. And I also want to say that we have every right of self-defense. And I, I, I don't think those conversations need to happen online, but I also think there's this thing in the United States where when African-American and other people of color start talking about how do we actually defend our own bodies and ourselves, that people go, wait, wait, that's too extreme. No, it is not too extreme. Okay, because if the Proud Boys can exist in Albany, New York, then what is happening down south in Puerto Rico or other places? And I think part of the counter programming is what this younger generation is brilliant at, right? What do we do right now at this moment to counter that narrative? Whether I agree with the whole vision of your organization, what you're giving me is something that I can show to young people that that's not the way it is. But also the United States, you know, our mentality is to have a very, very short requiem for history. And Dr. John Henry Clark talked about this brilliantly, mm -hmm. even when he was blind and, and <laughs> he was still writing books and he mentored so many of us. He talks about that history is not re repetitive as it's a, an in continuum. And what is the job of the historian? Well, the job of the historian is to now engage history as a public good, as a public need. Because if you ask anybody under 30, what about Waco? They'll be like, I don't know. That's where our, there's a home design show in Waco, Texas. Or <laughs> what about the move bombing? What are you talking about? I don't know. Where did they move to? No, the move, you know, like that's real because they're being programmed in billions of dollars. So, you know, and, and this is my selfish plug. I'll, I'll end on this. As you can see, this movie <laughs> that's coming out uh, this Friday. And, you know, um, Lumumba is my comrade and might have known for the three years I've been in this process, how amazing it has been, but how tough it has been. You know, but the part of the toughness that I found in this thing is right. You know, all my critiques of Hollywood, I in a way have to embrace it right now. But, you know, I want people to understand clearly that Fred Hampton and his, his mother, Comrade Aku and Jerry were with this from the beginning. And it's been a struggle. And yesterday I interviewed Fred, We, me and Dr. Jared Ball interviewed Fred, and I asked Fred a question about, what is it like to have grown up only being known as the son of somebody? And he said, it's been a blessing and a burden. You know, so for me, I hope that this movie is part of our arsenal, wherever we are, in Puerto Rico here or somewhere else in the world, um, that we can say, you know, this is not a documentary. It kind of does humanize the snitch and, and what I would call that. And what Fred spoke to this about brilliantly, he said, Rosa, what you have to remember is that William O'Neill wasn't the only one, right? And that when William O'Neill finally told his truth is the day he died. And Fred said, 
it's about understanding the systems and all this way. So I hope that, you know, folks watch this. I hope we have watch parties. I hope people critique it and I hope people embrace it. And I, and I hope that the younger generation out here who's really flipping how we look at, you know, this counter programming strategy. I mean, I'm ready to embrace it even more. You know, I'm a little older. Lumumba obviously older because he has mad gray hair, you know, but <laughs> we're here. We're here to mentor, as everybody has said, mentor, but for what reason? For the reason of existing, resisting, and liberation. Well, I think that we've done good. And I want to thank you all uh, for being part of this discussion and being so sharing and being so involved and so wonderful in the work that you're doing and standing up for all of us. Uh, the process of having these conversations, as I said before, is because our people need to hear the voices from our communities in critical ways and in the way that we're thinking. And we may agree or disagree in different points, but we know that our focus is our people, our children, our future, and our presence, right? Uh, in terms of being seen and being understood and being and defining ourselves in ways, as Rosa said, right? That doesn't um, compare us to anybody else, but to the fabulousness that we are, the intelligence that we are, and the honoring of those who came before us so we can push forward and articulate what they taught us. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Oh, do you have any final words before uh, no. we sign off? Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I think we we touch on on uh, important points. Uh, we do have we do want to have a conversation that is more so a workshop that might and or might not be this kind of conversation where we work towards how does that look like, right? How does we go about it? How do we create the organizations that we're talking about that are relevant in the context of today, of right. what's happening today? And as Rosa is mentioning, this 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 new group of people that are coming on, the young generation, they are clearer than ever. Um, and, and taking advantage of that, incorporating um, a multi generational, a multi sector. Um, um, a multi-racial uh, uh, and cultural group to have that conversation and to build upon what what you're saying, Martha, uh, and what everybody has said. How we built this this new um, organizations and institutions of the future. How do we build narrative? How do we build uh, media outlets and networks that will work towards um, depleting? the system of their food and their air, right? Because it seems like sometimes that er everything we, we go about, the system is, is prevalent, um, but we know that it isn't. And we know that it ha we have uh, um, right here within, you know, as a representation of our institutions and our culture and our community, we have enough people and enough knowledge to build. So next, it's, 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 it's a meeting where we, we get together and we work on it. Absolutely. So I'd like to thank you all for participating, the audience for listening and being with us. And we will continue conversations. And the next one will be a workshop because it's been called. So yes. thank you. Yes. <laughs> so thank you have a good evening. Yes, Bless thank you. you all. Thank you. Bye. Good night.